We do have a sponsor this morning. So before I turn it over to Kevin, I want to see if anybody, I didn't see Scott join us, but if anybody's here from Union Home Mortgage, as you can see, I'm sporting their logo this morning. So even though they might not be here, they are certainly here in spirit. And I'm gonna go ahead and pop their information um, in the chat. I know that Scott Hine is certainly a very familiar name and face to many of you. He is now with Union Home Mortgage. Nothing has changed in terms of their location. They're still right there on Lafayette Boulevard in the Builder Building. Um, and I'll put his new information in the chat um, for you all. If he does end up jumping on or if anybody does come on, we'll make sure we pause to give them a moment to say hello. Um, and talk about some of the great stuff they have going on. I will give a plug for a future meeting we're going to do with Scott. I don't know if any of you remember, several years ago, we did a class on 3M, Manufactured Mobile and Modular. We're going to run that class again this year. It was very popular and pretty, I think, applicable for talking about Spotsylvania County. And um, now uh, Scott's new company actually does do uh, mobile home loans. So he'll be able to speak very, very specifically um, about that. So that's going to be a coming class. Um, but without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Kevin Marshall. He's going to talk today. Kevin has a unique perspective because he's not only a Board of Supervisor member, but he's also the business development uh, person for Spotsylvania County. So I know that there's probably a decent amount of you who are very interested in the schools topic. I want to leave plenty of time to answer questions, but we're going to talk about economic development stuff first. So I'll ask that you hold any school questions until the end um, so we can make sure we cover things like um, the veterans clinic and transportation and new job opportunities, new businesses. Um, so with that, Kevin, thank you so much. You've been a frequent visitor of ours and we always love to see you. So take it away. Well, good morning, everybody. And I say, I'll, I'll be real brief, give you a brief update on what's going on in Spotsylvania County um, or as economic development. Then I'll be happy to answer anyone's questions. You can ask me anything. It doesn't matter to me if it's schools, transportation, development, anything. Anything we got in Spotsylvania, hopefully I can give you the answer to. Uh, but right now, of course, um, if anybody's rode by the new the VA hospital site, we've got steel coming up. Um, every day you ride by there, seems the building's getting bigger and bigger. Um, we've added a little bit to the VA hospital uh, from the uh, <clears throat> original set of plans. The VA hospital will now have the first VA women's health facility. Uh, so that's uh, the first First one in the country, first time the VA has offered that, uh, and that'll be right here in Spotsylvania County, so we're uh, glad of that. You can see also the new Chick-fil-A right down the street from the VA hospital, um, and we have, uh, have several big announcements getting ready to come up here in Spotsylvania County. Um, we have a new, uh, new industrial park that will be built um, Sometime here in the next probably 18 months, so we may see some uh, some movement on that. But a piece of uh, piece of property has been purchased uh, for a technology based industrial park uh, around 300 acres here in the county. Um, there's a lot of interest for industrial uh, warehousing, and we don't have a lot of it. Um, so hopefully this helps meet that need for not just Spotsylvania, but for right, throughout the whole region. I know Stafford County's got some uh, some big buildings going up, but those buildings are uh, they're already leased out to, to companies and they're being built to spec um, through out the state of Virginia right now. There seems to be a shortage of hundred thousand square foot warehousing facilities, and uh, I'm hoping with this new technology park, we'll be able to sneak a couple of those buildings in, and uh, along with some other some high tech uh, businesses that are looking at the county and have a model for the rest of the state. It'll be a good uh, good project for Spotsylvania. Um, there's some more big announcements coming up. I can't give those away, but pay close attention to Spotsylvania County between now and uh, the middle of February. I'm anticipating doing a big announcement with, uh, with the governor's office here very shortly on a huge project. Um, besides that, we have uh, numbers wise, 209 new businesses. Uh, this year, that was down just slightly from last year. We were at 225 last year, but our, our numbers are still uh, a lot higher than some of the other folks throughout the state of Virginia. And uh, we're doing very well with economic development here. So be happy to take anybody's questions about any anything else we've got in the county or any of our projects. So I'll read some questions from the chat, but I think that just my personal interest, and I think a lot of people are interested um, in the VA center. I mean, very exciting that we got that opportunity down here. 
Um, but certainly when we talk about the VA, there's a lot of talk about infrastructure. What is the look plan for um, you know, upgrading that intersection where it will be? I know we just built a Royal Farms right there at the corner of Hood Drive and Route 1. Um, how will those infrastructure um, needs be, be addressed going forward since it's already a pretty busy road and intersection anyway? <clears throat> yeah, the, the transportation aspect with the VA, there's several improvements. There's going to be some improvements to Hood Drive. There'll be an entrance to the VA off of Hood Drive that will have a right in and a right out. Um, the other main entrance will be off of Route 1. It's going to have, a, it'll be signalized uh, with a traffic signal. Um, the Hood Drive, Mine Road, Route 1 intersection. VDOT has a couple options there. Uh, the option that's been proposed by VDOT is called a quadrant roadway. That would be, and that project would cost $25 million is the estimate on it. That would make, in, or, in order to, I, and I'm, I'll be upfront, I don't agree with the uh, Quadrant Roadway. I think it is a ridiculous idea, and I'm happy, uh, ha will happily argue with VDOT till the end not to do what they want to do there. Um, north on Route 1, above that intersection, there will, have, there will be a traffic light if, with their plan. You would have to, in order to go left on the Hood Drive, you'd have to go straight through that intersection, go to the new traffic light, and hang a left, and then take another left and hang a right on the Hood Drive. It would be a road that went around behind the old Rite Aid and that auto parts store. It would eliminate all left-hand turn movements at that intersection. There are all four quadrants of that intersection have commercial businesses that have been there for a very long time. Only one that is unoccupied at the time. Those, those corners have been very high corners. Uh, the Rite Aid building, of course, is not occupied. It would be occupied today. There would be a business at Rite Aid, and it would have had an 11,000 square foot expansion onto the Rite Aid if it wasn't for that VDOT plan. The business backed away from that building because of that. Um, it's $25 million to put, a, to put that road in, is their estimate. I just, uh, we had a board meeting the other night. Uh, we can build Germana Point Parkway off of VDOT's estimate for 41 million. Um, I think we can, uh, there was some opportunities that we were looking into with some public private partnerships to build Germana Point Parkway at a cheaper price, uh, potentially saving about $15 million on that project. The, uh, that hasn't been finalized. It's just some preliminary talks for that to, you know, to make that cost savings. But um, my my opinion, if we build Germana Point Parkway, which Germana Point Parkway will become beside Germana College and parallel 95 and tie into Spotsylvania Avenue, that relieves the traffic on that intersection enough where that quadrant roadway won't be needed. So um, I know it. we're spending more money to save money because um, the Germana Point Parkway, of course, is a project that was on the books. But if that $41 million project and was trying to get that cost down, of course. If that's built but first, the need for the $25 million project will no longer be there. That's what I'm I'm hoping happens on that. But that are that that right now is the uh, what transportation improvements are there. And it'll, it'll be turn lanes and things under, you know, with the uh right of way there to you know to be a right in and right out also with that traffic light. There'll be a turn lane for that at the main entrance. What's the comp expected completion date of the hospital? We're still, um, well, we we should be done in another 24 months. Okay. Maybe sooner, um, to be honest with you. Could be, could be in the 18 month range, but right now another 24 months. Okay. So one last question related to the VA clinic. So um, somebody asked what the VA hospital, they missed it, has the only what? It was the women's health division. Yes, a, a specific women's health. Yep, specific for women's health care. They're going to have a, a women's health care facility, and they've never had that in any VA hospitals. Okay, that's great. Just uh, one follow up on the on the VA clinic. Um, there's a lot of hotels there that don't look pretty between Route One and, and the VA clinic. Uh, Kevin, do you expect those to be uh, repurposed? Do, I mean, are there people that are kind of hunting around trying to make that kind of like what Chick Fil A did, where they took it and kind of revitalize it do you anticipate that we're we're hoping for that of course the, those hotels are privately owned we can't you know Spotsylvania county can't make them repurpose or make them look better right. the uh 
the hotel immediately adjacent to the VA in the back. It's uh, the Super Value Inn. They have already started doing renovations there. The reason, um, yeah, the, re the reason I ask is that there's been, I mean, we've been delivering meals there to uh, families who've been living there for the past at least two years. There's a lot of folks who actually live in those hotels. Mm -hmm. And so when that, when that development comes, they're going to displace a lot of folks who are going to end up either being in their cars or, or on couches and stuff. So just be aware of that, you know, uh, down the road, please. Yeah, that's, that's something that we're looking, that we're looking into. And um, I actually have a meeting uh, scheduled. I think it's two o'clock today with the, uh, at the food bank. And so they, they put together the hunger, hunger coalition, um, myself and Nick Miner, uh, from King George will be meeting with them this afternoon. They're kind of led, you know, try to discuss getting all the entities together that help the less fortunate, the folks that are living in the hotels. There's a lot of programs that are available, but none of these programs coincide and work together, especially when it comes to feeding folks. Um, you know, if we can get them all working together, we can, utilize everybody's resources and do a better job and take care of more people. And that's, uh, that's two o'clock today. We're going to try to discuss that and lay out a plan to get everybody working together. And, uh, I actually, I just finished my EDA meeting and I, uh, I, you know, we talked about affordable housing here in Spotsylvania County. Um, it was an apartment complex. I won't name, name them by name, but they had all income restricted housing is what they told me. Uh, they're getting ready to open up and I asked for, uh, what was the monthly rent? One bedroom, $1,300. Uh, three bedrooms was $1,700. I don't think that's very uh, affordable, <laughs> but that's the prices that they gave. <clears throat> and I know the real estate market's hot right now. So it's, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that is affordable now. I haven't, you know, tried to purchase a home or anything lately. So, <laughs> but it seemed very, uh, somebody making $40,000 a year is going to have a hard time living there. Yeah, I think that there's certainly folks who can attest to some of the tenant clients they're working with, but especially the one bedroom price sounds pretty high. I mean, a lot, a lot of folks you know, are, are aiming to be under a thousand for that one bedroom, which is almost impossible to do, it seems like in this region. So, yeah. okay. Um, speaking of apartment buildings, um, can you give us a little update on the one at the mall uh, completion date and how many children are expected to come out of that? The question is, Will the county, is there any plan to support the influx of children? Are you expecting an influx of children from that particular um, apartment complex? Not just that, uh, well, I'll, 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 I don't, I cannot remember the actual completion date on that project. Um, I want to say that the completion date was in 2025, but I don't remember what quarter. Um, so I apologize for that. I didn't have that one off the top of my head. Um, I'll, not just that apartment complex, but apartment complexes in general, and they're presented to the board of supervisors. Um, they're always presented with low numbers of kids going into our school system. The apartments that we have on Route 1 are a prime example. Um, if you happen to be behind the school bus when it stops there, the numbers that are presented to the board, you know, they'll say it's 2.7 kids per 50 apartments. Uh, that's not the case. These, that's a lot of children living in these apartments. Um, and that's something that we definitely need to address in Spotsylvania County. Um, right now with the numbers on the schools, with the enrollment numbers, um, and the things that are going on with the pandemic and a lot of other issues in the schools. <coughs> Excuse me. Enrollment numbers are, are, are leveling out. New people are coming here. New kids are coming into the system. But kids that are in the system are being pulled out of the system. A lot of kids are being homeschooled and going to private schools. Um, so that it's kind of it's kind of a it, the enrollment numbers have kind of leveled out because of that. But we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't an anticipate everyone doing that. That's that trend's going to end and gonna, that's going to level out as well. We uh, with what's on the books in Spotsylvania County, we need a new school, and we're gonna we're gonna need a be thinking ahead and building one here in the next five years. And is there one in the plan? That there's nothing in the plan for Spotsylvania County Board of Supervisors to build a new school. There, uh, of course, the bonds passed the uh, that you know gives the school board the authority to borrow to build one if necessary. Um, the school board does have the Spotsylvania County School Board 
has has started looking um, and now has added that they've, they've acknowledged that they're going to need to build a new school here in the future. Uh, where last year that wasn't acknowledged. Um, so it's a uh, process. It's a process. It is definitely a process in the uh, the redistricting effort that was done by Spotsylvania County Schools about two years ago was not very successful. In terms of redistributing population and trying to even that out better. Yes, it was not. Um, it could have been. It could have been done differently. Um, Spotsylvania High School, for instance, still has. Uh, I think they're. I checked it a couple months ago. I think they had room for 550 to 600 kids. A lot. Their, their numbers were down, and some of our other numbers are at at or over capacity. So. Right. Okay. It's definitely going to be a. Uh, there's a lot of housing units on the book uh, that, that that can be built. Yeah, um, I believe it's around. It was around the fourteen thousand mark. I think we're down to twelve thousand now, but because uh, a lot of them have have been built. Yeah, and with the you know, if you look at our past numbers, the demand is is pretty high. So it's not yes. crazy to think that those houses aren't eventually going to get built. Um, so hopefully this will be a quick one. Um, two questions: What is the status of the new sheets at Smith Station and Levels? When will that break ground? And then what is the status of the small office park in front of Cortland Park in that same area? The There are no plans submitted for the small office park at Cortland Park. They haven't, they haven't submitted anything yet. Um, that commercial property out there, we haven't, I haven't seen anything on that one yet. The sheets, the vote to approve the sheets got deferred to, until the March 22nd Board of Supervisors meeting. So... Currently, there has not been a decision by the Board of Supervisors to approve or disapprove that sheets. Okay. Um, all right, so a panhandling question. Um, somebody asked, the panhandling at Bragg and Plank needs to be addressed to clients that correlate that to an undesirable area. Garrisonville has a great signage that fixed it in Safford County. Is there any... Um, response planned? Cause I mean, I did, there are a lot of panhandlers on the section in, in Spotsylvania County fixtures at that intersection of, of route three and, and Bragg. Yeah, we had with the pan, the panhandling that's been going on, we had signs that were posted along route three that it wasn't legal when they couldn't do it. Um, some of those signs have been removed. It was actually uh, requested uh, by our board about two months ago to put those signs back up and uh, start to enforce that again. Um, and I haven't been on Route 3 to pay attention. I haven't been on Route 3 to tell you if those signs are back up yet or not. <clears throat> but it's, uh, I'm assuming there's, there's, there's definitely a large problem with that because uh, I've been getting some phone calls about it. Um, and I can talk to the Sheriff's Department and see where they're at with it. Okay, thank you. And anything that Kevin communicates back, I'll email out to the, the list of, of folks who signed up to attend. Um, so a question about that um, apartment complex. Do you happen to know the one in the mall, how many units were planned? We actually did a meeting on this, on this complex and on the redevelopment, um, and I can't remember what they said. I can't recall the number yeah, of units. That might be a question that we have to just shoot over to the planning department and ask what's, cause they usually have like a spreadsheet that has planned stuff and how many units. And my understanding when we met with them was that those were gonna be rental units. They were not condos. Those were not owner occupied. Those were rental units. I, I'm, I may be wrong. I believe it was 240 units, but I'm. Yeah, we might even be able to just quickly Google it. If when folks get to talking, I'll see if I can Google that real quick. Um, yeah. So just go ahead, Clay. Well, to follow up on that meeting we had with, was it Califaro or whatever? Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, I remember at that time we asked them if there were going to be any like, you know, um, affordable housing units there. I mean, not to get, not to harp on this, um, but his, his, I remember his response was the county didn't make me do it. I wasn't required by it, you know, and, and, and I'm just wondering, is there a mechanism or, I mean, is there a, do we not want to like, is that possible for the county to put those restrictions on a developer like that who wants to rezone or is it or is it hands off as far as the county goes yeah we we can't put a restriction and make uh we don't have any ordinance that says you have to do a certain percentage of affordable housing with a develop with a housing development no okay thanks okay so i pulled an old article 
from the freelance star from December of 2020, but it's quoting 271. So, I don't know if that's still accurate, but it seems like 200 is a good a good guess. Yeah, I was off, I was off by 31. <laughs> yeah. Um, so still talking about you know the apartments, and you had said that those projections um, apartments are often undercounted. How many children actually end up going to school? So one of the questions is um, you know concern is about the already the pressure that's already on the schools. Why are we building more when we can't support what we have? And I think that just I mean Kevin, obviously I want you to to weigh in, but that. And that's just the building process. These things are approved and they're not directly tied to the capacity of the schools. That's the, the, the proper system is how we deal with impacts from, from development. Yeah, and, and proper law has changed. We can't require a proffer anymore. Um, we can suggest, but they can't be mandated or required <clears throat> for, the, for the proffers. Yeah, I mean, proffers were always voluntary. Um, but they, you know, they sweeten the pot for uh, folks like Kevin who can say, okay, this is going to be a big development, but we're going to get X, Y, and Z from it. I mean, the proffer law was tightened up significantly in 2016. And in order to be able to have a, a proffer for a certain impact, it needs to be directly attributable to the new development. So, you know, it's not that this place is already at capacity. It, it's, it really needs to have that direct connection. So if you've got a, you know, a building here in the mall area, but you wanna expand Massaponics High, that's not, that's not gonna work. So it is, developers are a lot more narrow in what they are able to offer up. Um, and obviously the county is a lot more narrow in what they are able to, to discuss on, with a developer on what might be an appropriate, appropriate proffer. And, and and with the apartment complexes here in Spotsylvania County, um, I don't know if uh, how many folks that are that are on this Zoom meeting have uh, been watching our board meetings. But our uh, Roger Harris, our sheriff, he came and presented to our board about some issues with some apartment complexes, um, and he 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 named a few of them out, um, not by name but by location and areas that they were in. We're having a big problem with crime at these apartment complexes. Um, big problem with drugs, big problem with breaking and entering. Uh, we've had some uh, shootings, some stabbings. Um, it's, it's, a big, it's a big concern for our sheriff's department right now. Our sheriff's department, for them to come before the board of supervisors and specifically name out areas and apartments and single them out, um, we, we've got a problem. We've got to find a way to fix that problem. We, um, and it's you know, they're, by this type of housing, they're seeing these huge increases in crime in our area. And that's something that we've got to stop. We've got to get our, you know, how we do that and the, the plan to do that with the sheriff's department. Uh, I know they're working on it, but it's something that we are very aware of. And it's something that we want to be able to cut this, this problem back. Okay. Linda, did you have a question? No, okay. Um, so quick question on the schools. When you said that we need a new school, um, is that elementary, middle, or high? That, that's, a, that's, a question. <laughs> that's a question for the school board, of course. We'd have to look at their numbers. Um, I know that uh, I've been contacted by some teachers um, at Cedar Forest. We have some classrooms that are way over capacity at Cedar Forest. Um, and we've got some uh, middle school capacity issues as well. Our high schools right now seem to be fairly leveled out. I do believe that, you know, I'm, the school system says Mass Ponics High School is under capacity. Um, I think we probably need to look at uh, changing the capacity numbers there because when those kids change classes, it's, it's wall to wall. I mean, it's, I don't know how you get another kid in the hallway. <clears throat> but that, that question, I can't, uh, without running the numbers and, and meeting with the school board representatives and to see, you know, that's, that's something that we need to look at, pull the numbers and the location, of course, not only do we need to take, when we go to build a new school, take into effect that the current population numbers, but we need to see what's on the books and what's already approved to be built. Okay. Um, so everyone's really excited about the potential new announcements. What would you recommend as a base? best place for information, the county's website, certainly it'll be in the paper. 
It should be in every paper in the state of Virginia. All right. <laughs> so, so take your pick. All right. Yeah, it, should, it, should, it should be in every, yeah, we're, I'm, I'm waiting on the governor's office uh, for a date to do the announcement. It'll okay. be, a, it won't be a huge, we won't be shooting off fireworks and releasing blooms just yet, uh, but it will be a public announcement made through spots of any county in the governor's office. Well, we look forward to that. Um, so the proposed exit at Jackson Gateway in relation to Alexander Crossings pending approval, what is your opinion on this potentially being built? Proposed, I'm sorry, that you said the exit? The exit, is there a 95 exit being proposed down there? No, no new, no new, so. no new off ramp or on ramp. Alexander Crossing, um, when they submitted the plan for that in Jackson Village, they had a flyover over the interstate. But those, uh, neither one of those developments are to that phase or uh, to that particular point where that's being designed or submitted yet. Right. Okay. Um, so this is a great question. Not that they all haven't been great, but I know this is on a lot of folks' minds. Can you please share any insight you have on any new businesses or large-scale commercial development that is planned for the Thornburg area? Thornburg area is a very hot area with a lot of uh, commercial zoning there. We've got 100 acres of C2, another 70 acres of C2 uh, along the 606 Route 1 corridor. And it's, it's drawing a lot of interest, interest from a lot of different folks. There's nothing that I can publicly uh, announce or say at, right now about any project at Thornburg. Uh, the, newest, the newest addition, of course, is a True by Hilton, which is, uh, we just opened that up a few months ago. Very nice hotel. I was, uh, I was there for the grand opening of it and it was, uh, I was, I was shocked at the, at the actual finished product. Uh, Hilton, you know, that's supposed to be Hilton's lower end hotel. Um, I didn't see anything really low end about it. It was a very nice facility. So. Great. Um, okay. So I know Kevin McGrath, do you want to just unmute? Cause I know I, you can do better justice to your comments. I think that it bears repeating. Um, about the traffic issue, you know, traffic concerns potentially at the at the mall. Well, thank you, Kim. Um, so, uh, you know, we're putting those apartments in, and we had that meeting that uh, Mr. Murray referenced so eloquently um, with Kafaro. He said that the apartments were going to generate less traffic at that intersection than the Sears. Well, I can tell you that anybody shop that shopped at that Sears in the last ten years knows that that is a complete line of BS. There is There was never anybody in that Sears ever. So he, again, Clay mentioned that he said he wasn't required to do a traffic study. So my concern is you put whatever number of units in there, I forget it was 1,300 or 900 or whatever, figure two cars per unit. 271. Going. How many? 271. Uh, well, I was way off, Kim, sorry. Thanks for correcting me in public, I appreciate it. Clay, <laughs> uh, just stop laughing. But 271 times two cars times two, that's a thousand cars roughly coming in and out of there every day. Well, I can tell you there's no way there were a thousand cars going to Sears every day. That's my concern. Yep, and that, that's a concern I've had with not only uh, when you look at that project, but there, there's a, when they do the traffic impact analysis, they call them TIAs for any project. Um, they give us those traffic numbers. Um, they're to a very small area when you get that. Um, to give, to give you an example, there was a TIA done recently, um, for a proposed development at Thornburg, a residential development there, um, that has, has not been approved with a TIA and of, of sorts it, it, that's public. It was getting ready to go to the planning commission. Um, it gave just the numbers at the entrance to the development, the impact. It didn't take in how it would affect the traffic light. You know, there's only one traffic light there. So, of course, everybody who would live in that development would go to that traffic light. Same thing with the, with the mall. Um, I'm wondering when they did that impact analysis and they look, of course, when you do the impact analysis on commercial, they do it all ba based off of a square footage, um, not on, you know, the business being successful or unsuccessful. So those numbers, what you're talking about, you're exactly right. Those numbers get skewed. Um, and they get, and you got to be able to pick through that. And, and one other thing I'd like to add, and this is probably just a pet peeve, but could somebody talk to BJ's about their setup? Because people are lining up for gas and it's blocking the right hand lane. And it really affects my sanity when I'm trying to go home at night. So <laughs> that's a pet peeve. 
I got you. I can mention, I'll mention something to VDOT and. Uh, I just don't feel like BJ should be able to have their clients just lining up in the right-hand turn lane where everybody's trying to come out of Central Park. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I wasn't aware of that, but I'll, I'll check. I'll talk to VDOT and see if there's anything that can be done, or if we can set uh, set up a meeting with with BJ to see if it's something we can real. They can do something different with their parking lot, possibly. I appreciate I it very up much. There all you. the time in the morning. Don't mess with my cheap gas, Kevin McGrath. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so talking of cars, there is a question. Oh, Clay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, jump in. Oh, well, um, so just I, don't, I haven't kept up with what VDOT's doing south of 130, but I saw that the local and express kind of dump onto three lanes after one exit 130. And, and is there any plans for Mass Ponics to re getting relief uh, south? Or uh, just forgive me for knowing for not knowing what what VDOT's up to, but looks like it all just dumps into Spotsy now, and uh, all brake lights. <laughs> It doesn't only just dump into spots. It's dangerous when you get on southbound 95 off of Route 3. Um, you've got cars coming at you at 80, 85 miles an hour, and you're, you're getting onto the interstate at 60, 65 miles an hour, and it's, it's a dangerous setup. Right. Um, yeah, the, there's some interchange improvements there, of course, for the 126, but they're, you know, we won't see a shovel in the ground on them for another three to five years. Um, and – you know, there's, of course, the long-range planning of VDOT. They're going to continuously add lanes and move everything down towards Caroline. But uh, right now, it, you're exactly right. Everything is dumping right into us, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a mess right there. Um, I, I agree with you. And uh, it all takes, it takes money, and, you know, it's, uh, it seems our federal and state highway money continuously dwindles down, and – you know, it gets put on the locality and, uh, you know, it's, we'll never, I, I, my personal opinion, we'll never catch up on transportation unless we get, we need some help from the feds and from the state um, because the local taxpayer of Spotsylvania can't afford to live here and build the traffic improvements that are needed. We've, we painted ourselves in a corner over the last 50 years in Spotsylvania County with transportation. We're fighting to get a, get out of it. We're trying to make the best decisions we can for us that are, you know, feasible financially for the citizens of Spotsylvania County. But uh, when you're putting asphalt down, it gets expensive. It's, it's, it's no other way, no other way to put it. And there's no easy, easy solution to it. It all takes time. Uh, VDOT projects seem to take forever to get done. Uh, that's why we're exploring some public private partnerships on a, uh, on some, you know, some of our transportation improvements. We've, we've got to find a better, quicker way to get things done. So speaking of cars, someone commented on the, the seeming proliferation of car washes, um, especially on Route 3, I'd say. Um, anything uniquely interesting about Spotsylvania County that so many car washes are interested in? I have no idea why there's so many car washes that are interested. I'm assuming that the, uh, you know, everybody that goes to get their car washed, it's, uh, you know, you're paying anywhere between eight to twenty dollars, I think, per car wash, and we've got a hundred and four, a hundred and better than hundred forty thousand people here in Spotsylvania. And when you're on the Route Three corridor, you're, um, of course, everybody that travels out there knows there's a there's a bunch of traffic, a bunch of cars. So I guess that it's it's the demand and the amount of vehicles that go up and down Route Three. They're probably basing it off of traffic counts. Okay. So we have a question. I'm not familiar about this. It says, can we get an update on the new hospital coming on Route 3 near the propane slash diesel fill station? Yep, I can give you an update on that. We just done the groundbreaking ceremony for that. Um, the first part of December, I believe it was. Yeah, first of December. Um, that is Spotsylvania Regional Freestanding Emergency Facility. And where is that? Uh, Single Oak Road and Route 3 beside the Corals Filling Station. Okay. Interesting. Uh, it'll, be, uh, so it'll be Spotsylvania Regional's version of the Lee Hill Medical Center that Mary Washington has. Um, they will take emergency transports there. Of course, they won't be able to take, it'll, there'll be limitations the same as the Lee Hill Medical Center has, but they will have a, a CT scan machine there. Um, that's something that I went and spoke in favor of because uh, you have to get, that has to be permitted through the state. Um, I've, we actually had the the, pub, the public meeting was held. Uh, so that was 
two and a half, maybe three years ago to get that permit for that machine for that facility. Um, I had to go to the library in downtown Fredericksburg and attend that and speak in favor of it for Spotsylvania Regional. And there was opposition, of course, to it. But the opposition was Mary Washington Hospital because it would be a competitor. <laughs> um, that was the, uh, you know, it's a shame that you that another healthcare facility would speak out against another one. But that's the business side of the healthcare industry. Um, if the folks that live in Western Spotsylvania need a CT scan they will now be transported to that Spotsylvania Regional facility um, because it'll be the closest appropriate facility. And Mary Washington would rather you come there so they can bill you for it. Um, and if Mary Washington was doing something south of Spotsylvania Regional, I'm sure Spotsylvania Regional would speak out against Mary Washington's project as well. So that's the business side of healthcare. Um, it's sad that that there is a business side to healthcare because you want people to get appropriate care as quickly as possible. But um, I'm, that's that's going to be a great facility for Spotsylvania County. How many um, beds? Somebody asked. I'm sorry. How many beds at the new place? They won't have overnight stays. They'll have the. It'll be just like the Lee Hill facility. Okay. You'll be able to come in there for some things. Not uh, that you know. Of course, if you need, if you're having a major. Uh, issue in the hospital where you would have to stay overnight they would transfer you to one of the other facilities but they'll be able to stabilize you and get you the emergency care that you need um they won't they won't drive past there if you're having a heart attack you come there get stabilized get what you you know and if you need to stay overnight they'll transfer you okay all right um so you know moving on to to the school's question i've certainly gotten a lot of outreach in the last week or two from agents who are concerned about um you know just the the perception of the schools to the wider clientele right i mean this is a this is a lagging indicator for real estate but they're worried about and i've heard from clients expressing concerns about their choice to move to spotsylvania county because it's not fabulous when your school board makes the news for reasons as as it did um so what is how does that work that relationship between the school board and the supervisors because i mean the school board runs the schools and really just comes to you all with a number request. How does that, how does that, that interaction work? That's, that's the, but that's, that's the school's budget. And it has been since I've been on the board of supervisors and uh, it's pretty easy to explain. Um, they come to us with a budget request. Um, we approve whatever we approve the amount and um, that is given to the schools. Once they get that money, they have the authority to do what they want with that money. Um, and it's, it's the way it's been ever since I've been on the board. Um, the budget requests that I've seen in the past are, um, they're very difficult to follow, very difficult to read and dig into because you don't get, it's not a line, line item budget that's presented to you. Um, and then even if it was, they have the ability to appropriate and move that money where they want to move that money. Um, Kim, you were very nice in your comments leading into this. Um, I'm probably not going to come across as nice. Uh, I've been watching these school board meetings. I've been watching the public comment sections and the responses from our school board members. And um, I'm not going to pick on any particular school board member in any of my comments. Um, I'm going to pick on the school board as a whole. It looks like something off of Comedy Central. It's an embarrassment to Spotsylvania County with the way these folks have been acting. They're talking over one another. They're talking down to one another. Uh, the meetings have not been, the last one was ran a little bit more orderly. Um, Robert's Rules of Order. I don't think, it did, you know, as they've been run, I don't think they've ever looked at that book. And um, it's, it's been, uh, I've been very displeased with it. Um, I've reached out to several school board members and told them that I was displeased of it. Um, I mean, I, I, I will give a, a, a good, whoever makes the gavels that we use at our meetings, um, they got good handles in them because at, at a couple of the last meetings, I thought the handle was going to break out of that thing. Um, it's, I wish I had more control and uh, we could step in, but the Board of Supervisors, we don't have that ability. Those folks are elected officials the same as me, uh, elected by the people and, you know, they, they govern themselves. We just, we just appropriate their funding. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm to the point to where I want to see the money spent on the kids. I want money spent on the kids. You know, I, I, I use the analogy of building a house. 
the kids are the foundation. That's your concrete. Then you go to your teachers. That's your next step. You know, that's your framework. You know, then we can uh, we can decide that when we get to the you know when we get to some of the extracurricular activities and some other things. Let's. Uh, I'd rather see when the budget's presented. Um, budgets always presented. Pay raises are always an increase to the budget. Um, if pay raises are needed to keep teachers here in Spotsylvania County, they should be built into that framework of the budget. We should be talking about lights for ball fields. We should be talking about putting turf on fields and things that can, you know, CIP projects that could be pushed back. Some of the, you know, the shing, you know, when you're building a house and you get to the point of putting shingles on a roof, we can make the decision that we want a 40 year shingle or a 20 year shingle. And we can discuss the price of some of the smaller things that may not be needed for educational purposes. That should be, if there's an overage in the budget, those, those are the issues that should be the overage. It shouldn't always be uh, teacher salaries that, you know, those salary increases, if they're needed and you got to have them, that should be built into the base of the budget, not what extra, what you're asking for extra for. Um, you know, that's, I'd rather, and it's, and that's, you know, that's, uh, that's the politics of finance. Um, cause when you, you know, when you put it as you want to get that extra money in your budget, you put it as for teachers raises, well, guess what the teachers are going to do. They're coming to speak out. They, we need this extra money because we, you know, we want our raises and we need our raises, build it in the baseline of the budget. And, you know, let's, let's have, you know, let's, I'd rather hear from somebody that says, Hey, we're going to turf uh, spots of a high school baseball field. It's going to cost a million dollars and. You know, this extra million dollars we're asking for, that's what it's going for. Okay, well, if we can afford to do it, that's great without raising our taxes. But if we can't afford to do that, let's put that off till the five, you know, let's put that off a year because we can we can play on grass for another year. It's not going to, you know, we're not going to shut the doors down because we don't have a turf baseball field. So that's that's my my take on the, uh, on the schools and the school's budget. And I want folks to to jump in and you can unmute and ask or pop it in the chat but where do you see um that the relationship about I mean, the relationship between the board and the school board where do you see the school board going from here i think a lot of agents concern is that you know if the if the county gets a reputation of having a subpar quality school system that is not good for property values not good for folks and i've had a couple agents email me um, comments from their clients saying, I'm now regretting my purchase in Spotsylvania County. Now, obviously people are very emotional after that, that board mm -hmm. meeting, that was obviously hard to watch. Um, but, you know, if that continues, if that kind of contention on the school board continues, that's not, that's not good for, for the county. It's not good. It's not good for the county. I hope that they make a, that they make some major, um, you know, that it, it seems, and it's very obvious when you watch these meetings, it's, uh, it's some people on that school board and some members, they don't like each other. But you don't have to like a person to work with somebody. And if you're in an elected position, you're not there to, you don't have to like any of the people that you're working with. You're there for the people that you represent. And the people that are being represented are, are upset. They're mad on both sides of the aisle. They're not, uh, you know, it's for different, different reasons, you know, um, several different reasons. It's bad not only for the real estate market, it's bad for economic development. It's bad for our workforce. We're, we're trying to get a lot of, we're working on some workforce programs through Virginia Career Works and Bacon Soratorium. Um, we've got a new uh, STEM center um, out on, uh, at Dr. Hebron's old office, old Spotsylvania Emergency Center is gonna be turned into a STEM center, a nonprofit STEM center. We're trying to build our workforce and get our kids, not every kid goes to college. We're trying to, we gotta give the kids the opportunity. They are our workforce. They're, you know, we gotta build our workforce. And when our school system and the parents are not comfortable with our school system and not happy with our school system, it, it has a major effect, not just on the educational value and the real estate value, but it, it hurts us in out years because that's that becomes our workforce. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Anybody have any questions for Kevin about the school stuff? Any other questions? And Suzanne, I saw your comment about FAR members attending. I mean, if folks live in those districts and they're concerned, please, by all means, go. Um, you know, that's certainly a very powerful message that folks have to share. At this point, FAR doesn't have any sort of coordinated effort on the schools. We have not ever traditionally got involved in school issues. They are so, so parochial and local and specific to individual schools and districts that we just don't have the capacity to dig down like that. 
Um, but I think we can say, and a bunch of my folks in the call are PPC members, uh, we brought this up when we interviewed the new candidates running for um, the Livingston District, and you know, we're talking with Kevin about it now. I think that there's there's certainly opportunities for FAR to um, share that, uh, you know, these kinds of things while not getting into the details, we all know are not are not great for our county as a whole from a housing perspective, from economic development. So, um, and the school board members email addresses are just on the school board website. I mean, all you have to do is Google Spotsylvania School Board and it's, it's all right there. Um, so PPC is meeting next week and we will be talking about this issue. Um, but I will be frank in saying, I do not necessarily think we will have some large coordinated response just because of those limitations on how specific these issues can be. And we just don't have the capacity to understand them in enough of a way to really engage in, in a way that I think would make, make a difference. But talking to folks like Kevin, I think does make a difference because he understands that big picture um, just like we do. So. And Kim, and Kim I, I'd, encourage, I'd encourage your members to reach out to the school board members because uh, with all the controversial issues that have been going on with our school board, I bet you none of them have considered how it would affect the real estate market. Oh, sure. Yeah. <coughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, our agents tend to be a pretty engaged group. So, you know, if you all have concerns, please feel free to reach out to your individual school board members. Yeah. And to your point, Kim, it's like we are a very diverse 1800 member organization that I think there's, I don't think we could all bring together one, one sole opinion to the school board as possibly county. Yeah. It'd be a challenge. Um, snow removal took a long time to clear. Yeah, I know. I mean, this one I think is such a hard, everybody was in that position. I live in this in Idlewild and I had, didn't have power for four days. I mean, that's, it was baffling to me how I could live right off route one and not get power back for so long. So I think this specific storm was so challenging, but just, can you touch on snow removal more generally? I know this one was an especially bad situation all around. Um, yeah, I, I can I, actually, I've, uh, I'm glad to ask that because uh, the snow removal well, during this first storm was ridiculous. Um, I was out of power myself uh, for seven days um, and I had to uh, take my own equipment and clear my road and cut my road out. And it took a uh, very long time to do that. And uh, I was I was prepared. Um, the board meeting we had right uh, right after that storm. My, my, you know, I was prepared to make the statement. I was you know, going to ask the question, ask county staff to ask VDOT if they had sold all of their snow plows and trucks uh, because I hadn't seen one during the storm. Uh, then I, I got a phone call from Mr. Kyle Bates that works for VDOT right before our meeting, and my opinion of it changed. Um, of course, when we have a big snowstorm, VDOT throws all, all their resources to Interstate 95. Well, with what happened on the, the rate of the snowfall and what happened on 95, his VDOT trucks and plow trucks were stuck in that gridlock on 95. And that's why we didn't see them on our secondary roads and our rural roads. Um, so it was a situation, not that they didn't have the resources or didn't have the people, they couldn't mobilize them because they were all stuck on 95. Um, and then once, uh, in, you know, then they had to play catch up with then it had, we had a little bit of melt and it would refreeze and, and when that happens and people have driven on the roads, it packs it and it's hard to get it. You know, you can't get the snow off the road. The plow skips over it. I was ready to hammer VDOT after that storm, but after I got an explanation from them, uh, I, I did not do that. They, uh, they'd done the best they could. They were, he, he flat out told me, he said, I don't think I, more resource, any more resources would have helped me um, because I couldn't get them there. We did in Spotsylvania County, uh, we put what resources we had on the roads. Um, and I, I don't know that we're going to get paid for it. We've, we've submitted, uh, to the state to get paid for it through, cause we were in a state of emergency. We can get reimbursed for that, those funds, but we put our parks and recs and our utility staff, every snowplow that Spotsylvania County owned, we were pushing state maintained roads with them. We took our rubber tire loaders, uh, from our landfill. We had three of those. Uh, we put them on the road, pushing snow as well and removing trees with those loaders as well. So what resources we had in Spotsylvania County, um, we didn't wait for VDOT to ask us. We put them on the road to do what the you know do what we could. Uh, we had you know over 400 square miles of Spotsylvania County. We were uh, you know my little bit of equipment I had didn't make a big dent, but it did help out some folks. Yeah, thank you for that. Somebody said also the trees, but I mean 
that was just such an unprecedented storm. It looks like a tornado went through Route 3. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's hard to think of a storm quite of that magnitude, just the number of trees down just everywhere. Um, I'm sure the, the place folks just couldn't keep up with the amount of work that there was to do, so. And, that, and that's something that I needed. Um, I actually meant to do it at our last board meeting. I'm glad we brought this subject up because I forgot to bring it up at our last board meeting. I'll bring it up at the next one. Um, I'd like to be able to send, REC brought in a lot of subcontractors. A lot of people from other states came and helped us. Um, and they, it was an amazing response uh, of linemen that came out to work in some very rough conditions, some dangerous conditions for the first couple of days with the snow and stuff that were on the trees. They've done an excellent job. Um, I was, I seen, uh, it was Pike Electric, which is a, it's a huge electrical company uh, that has locations throughout the East Coast. But I watched those guys firsthand and there probably was, I've never seen anybody restore power and put set poles as quick as that in my life. I, you know, REC comes out and they put up, they were just replacing poles on 605 on Marie Road. They would get about four poles done a day. And that was in ideal conditions. This Pike Electric Company, when they came out, they had 12 trucks. They installed eight poles and restored power. Um, it was probably a mile and a half of line that they put, had to basically redo the whole thing. It was, it was amazing the uh, how quick they got that done i like to send letters to all those folks and thank them for their help because they really if it won't for those folks coming to help rec uh, i don't know if we have lights on today <laughs> no so i have one final question before we go but somebody asked about emergency preparedness uh, do you feel that the county's fully prepared to handle an emergency uh depends on what the emergency is um we i don't have the you know with the you know with this, with this snowstorm, I put all the resources I had, but my resources are limited on snow removal to doing parking lots here in the county, and our county facilities, our our landfill facilities, and our county office buildings. Um, you know, it's it, VDOT is supposed to you know they've got the equipment. We're just in a bad spot, but our general emergency preparedness, as far as state numbers go, what we're required to have. Um, by the state of Virginia right now, I don't have to have but 89 law enforcement officials, and we've got over 200. Um, so I think we're we're definitely well prepared, and we've got enough staff. Uh, we, we only have 89 state funded positions in law enforcement, and that's the requirement per. Uh, there's a number, one deputy per X amount of people in Spotsylvania County or any county in the state, and we well exceed those numbers uh, with fire and rescue and with uh, of our law enforcement. So I think uh, we're as well prepared for an emergency situation as anyone else in the Commonwealth, but um, you know, we've had some uh, natural events that have, uh, you know, technology has let us down. When we had the earthquake a few years ago, nobody's telephone would work. <laughs> it was, uh, nobody could call to check on anybody because everybody was calling and checking on everybody. So, um, Depending on the situation, we're as prepared as we can be, but we've had a few uh, few things I never thought we'd see, and you know we've we've managed and done well with them. So yeah, okay. Hopefully, this will be a quick one. Any um, updates on any potential commercial going in that Lake Anna Parkway, Brock Road area near the courthouse with all the new homes coming in, grocery, anything like that? And the no. Uh, there's talks of things coming in. I don't have any plans submitted. Okay. What about broadband? Any fiber? I mean, I know the other end of Spotsylvania County toward Lake Anna has got that fiber link option with Orange County, but what about closer into the courthouse area? We're, uh, we got shut down the uh, state grant we, we put in for with data stream. Uh, we did not get, we did not get that state funding. Um, we did not get it the year before when we put in for another grant. We're looking at the, uh, Looking at some stuff on the federal level um, with a rural connect program through the USDA with some, um, it would, it's meant to benefit farmers, but it would benefit everyone in between. Um, I don't, it doesn't, we've got a shot. I don't think we're going to get it. Um, we don't have enough farms in close proximity and that's what they're seem to be focusing on and the folks I've talked to about it. Um, they actually encouraged me not to put in for it, but I don't, you know, at least I didn't read my name and throw it in the trash. At least say Spotsylvania County, 
and know we're here if they're not going to give us any state and federal funding. Right. Um, at least let you know, let them know we're still after it. But um, pay close attention uh, to our next board meeting um, when our budget is presented, where there will be in the recommended budget. It's not the approved budget but there will be some funds through the American Rescue Act that are gonna be allocated to rural broadband. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm, to the, I'm to the point and I'm gonna to try to, if the federal and state government aren't gonna help us out, we're gonna to have to figure out the, how to do it on our own. And that's okay. where we're at and we're, we're preparing ourselves to do that. Right, okay, so final question, and we're right up at 11, but I didn't want somebody to think that I had forgotten about them. So thinking going forward, what do you think the board's perspective on growth is gonna be? Do you think we'll see more managed growth in the years to come? I know there's obviously a lot of infrastructure concerns and while our agents love selling houses, that is what they do. They wanna put people in homes. There's also balancing that concern with infrastructure schools, you know, all of that. Um, with the way the real estate market is right now and what has been approved, uh, there's still, pro there's a lot of projects that were approved in uh, 2014, 2015 um, that have not been built yet, but they're on the books, they're by right. Um, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, Heritage Hills is one that was approved in 2014. That's 1,060 units. Um, mixed use development that was approved back then uh, before I was on the board. Uh, there's another, uh, the, uh, of course, Alexander's Crossing. Those That was over 2,000 units that were approved. I think 2,600 units that were approved in that. Uh, these projects haven't broke ground yet, uh, but they're they're on the books and can be built. So I, I think uh, nothing in the near future, you, you'll, you'll say it's gonna be, you know, with the market, people are gonna start building these projects. Out. Um, so, you know, just if we make decisions and start to try to control growth as far as the residential side in the county, um, and I'm, I'm, fine with, I'm fine with doing that because right now our school capacity numbers and some of the problems we're having with crime, we need to control certain types of growth. Um, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of apartments right now after the presentation our sheriff gave us. It's something, that's a problem we need to address before we start approving more apartments. Um, we need to find a way to mitigate those problems. Um, so it'll, it'll to me, I think you're gonna see, it looks like it's a big boom in residential growth because those projects are already approved. And if any decisions are made to try to restrict any growth in the county as far as residential, you won't see that until the outlying years. Uh, it'll be, eight to 10 years from now. So you, before you'll see any kind of decline because it's, there's already enough on the books to, to show. And, and for what it's worth for our members, and I know I don't have to tell you all that the supply in the county is very low and it's, you know, we have an affordable housing problem because there's not enough homes. So we're really stuck in this challenging dichotomy of, you know, wanting to make sure we're managing to control for infrastructure challenges. But I just pulled up the active listings at the end of December, 196 houses, that's it on the market in Spotsylvania yeah. County, 500 across the region at the end of 2021. I mean, that's not a big number and there's very real issues with affordability. And if we further constrain supply, that will only get worse. So um, with those parting words, I know we're right at 11 o'clock. Thank you all so much. Um, Thank you.